Welcome back to First Trades. As promised in the latest edition of Rendezvous at the Taj, Nikunj Darmia caught up with Indian Hotels Managing Director and CEO Puneet Chatwal in conversation with Tata Steel's Managing Director and CEO TV Narendran as well. The titans of the Tata Group discussed how they're coping with the global challenges as well as sharing their growth roadmap. Listen in. I think uh, the company is strong because of the uh, market observer and therefore you made and the fact that we have consistently worked on improving ourselves we've recalibrated ourselves continuously we continue to be one of the lowest cost producers of steel which uh, ensures that we survive in a down cycle in the up cycle everyone looks good it's uh, what you do in the down cycle which matters and we continue to push our boundaries as far as customer relationships are concerned, products are concerned. We have an emerging B2C business as well, which is today 20% of our revenues. Uh, we do a lot of innovative work in the marketplace. And that helps us uh, protect our revenues as much as we could in a cyclical business, while at the same time being brutally focused on our costs and efficiencies so that we continue to be one of the lowest cost producers of steel. We also have a long value chain, uh, which ensures that we can ride the cycles better. Tata Steel made all the right headlines last year, record profit. I remember using this phrase on television that um, steel is the new gold. Uh, will FI23 be a year of slightly rusty or yeah. is, are things looking up? <laughs> will steel continue to shine yeah. on the path of gold? So Nikunj, I think uh, first and foremost this is a cyclical business but I think uh, what I've always said is, uh, you know, the steel prices in the down cycle in this decade will be higher than steel prices in the down cycle in the last decade, particularly in India, simply because India, after a very long time, is investing a lot on infrastructure. Uh, steel is, uh, you know, very uh, dependent on macroeconomic issues, is very dependent on investment-led growth. And India has traditionally had consumption-led growth. So this focus on investment-led growth, focus on infrastructure, is uh, great for the steel industry in India. And India is one of the best places in the world to produce steel because we have the iron ore, unlike China, unlike Japan, unlike Korea, right? So I think for many reasons, steel industry in India and certainly Tata Steel is uh, well positioned to capitalize on this opportunity. The current quarter is considered to be a slow quarter. Cyclicality kicks in, schools they start, and this is the quarter just before holiday season. So historically, the current quarter is always a weak quarter. But the channel checks are indicating that this could be one of the strongest slow quarter you've had. <laughs> uh, I think it would be fair to say, if I say on behalf of the industry now, uh, the industry is performing. You switch very smartly between the uh, yes. your company to the industry. <laughs> <laughs> so I think the industry is performing at 20% plus uh, pre-COVID-19-20 uh, levels on the top line. And if you've been good in your not like for like growth, which I come to Indian hotels, then you should be able to do on the top line a bit more than uh, what the average of the industry is doing. And uh, I think um, we are very, very positive about the outlook, especially this year. And the reason I, I have a strong belief in the India story I have a very strong belief that our focus in the last five years on growing our India footprint, uh, expanding to more than 100 locations in India, so nobody covers India like we do. If we add homestays to it, it is, it is 125 destinations. And with G20 leadership coming to India as of December for the following 12 months, I think it will give that additional boost. And if anything else was to happen, it will provide a natural hedge. So I think currently the hospitality industry so is well positioned. Shira, Christmas, everything is taken <laughs> care of. <laughs> How did you react when first time press compared Tata Steel numbers with TCS for the year gone by? <laughs> I think that's a good comparison to have, right? I mean, uh, TCS has been a shining star for the group and uh, for Tata Steel to match TCS uh, I don't know when we last did that was a great feeling but honestly we are in very different businesses uh, as part of the same group we hope TCS continues to do very well we are in a cyclical business we have ups and downs so uh, uh, it's of 
media interest more than anything else, right? But I mean, lag gaye na, because yeah. after that, <laughs> the expert duty came. Yes, that's true. So how, some, has damaged, how has that damaged your Well, business? I think that's the unfortunate thing, right? Why should people grudge an industry or a company uh, making profits? Because ultimately, private sector investment in India was being rev revived by the steel industry. I mean, steel industry had announced more than 100,000 crores of investments. No other private sector industry had announced that kind of investment. So somewhere I feel while there were pressures to deal with the inflationary issues, we respect that. But somewhere I think India should be a big producer of steel. India should be a big exporter of steel. Steel investments happen in some of the poorest parts of the country. We are blessed with iron ore. So this is a classic uh, opportunity to make in India for India and for the world. So. Uh, I think it's unfortunate. Uh, we appreciate and respect that it has happened, but uh, we hope that it will be removed soon because China, Japan and Korea together export 150 million tons of steel with no iron ore, with hardly any iron ore. So why should India, which has iron ore, be worried about exporting 10, 15 million tons of steel? You know, so that's a larger issue. So I think, yes, uh, it has uh, uh, obviously hurt the steel companies over the last few months. Uh, but I hope that over the next uh, few months and years, uh, this will get... Uh, but despite the duty on export, mm -hmm. are you still making uh, positive EBITDA? Yeah, we are. Like I said, we are one of the lowest cost producers of steel in the world, so uh, we can ride the down cycle well. Uh, as we've shown a few years back when steel price was $350, also we made money. So, uh, but the challenge uh, this time has been that coking coal prices have been quite high and that's 40% of our cost. Uh, that's linked to global geopolitical issues. Uh, but yes, uh, I think uh, we know how to survive in a down cycle also. So I'm assuming that the real impact of cooking coal advantage will only come for next quarter because what you're burning in this quarter would be coal bought at higher levels. Absolutely, absolutely. That's right. Because normally most of the cooking coal comes from Australia. So what you buy today comes to you after two months. So it helps your costs or hurts your costs two months later. So there's a lag. So last quarter's uh, costs will be impacted by what coking coal we bought the quarter before that and the lower coking coal prices will help us from next quarter. But an uh, environment like this, uh, Mr. Narendra, which is weakness in the currency or strength in dollar, the tailwind which was China has become a headwind and Europe is going through a serious energy crisis. From inflation now the fear is recession. So demand somewhere will get challenged. Yeah. So globally, yes, there is a concern. Uh, but I am a bit more uh, optimistic about Indian demand. Are you as optimistic as Mr. Chatwal? I think I am, but uh, <laughs> I don't have the advantage that he has with G20. But uh, certainly if the infrastructure investments that the government has announced uh, starts flowing through, it's, uh, you know, I think we'll have a few uh, years of strong demand. Because uh, you know, if I look at steel consuming sectors, pretty much everyone is strong. Construction is quite strong, apart from what happens during the monsoon. Uh, supply chain investments in supply chains, warehousing because of e-commerce companies. Passenger vehicles, commercial vehicles are back where they were four years back. Uh, and if more people travel, more hotels are built, I think that's good for us. Mm. Uh, Mr. Chatwal, you've increased what is called as the moat around your business. You've expanded when everybody was contracting. You were hiring when others were firing. You've incubated new brands while other brands were in a process of either shutting down or they were consolidating. What have you done in the COVID to increase the moat or perhaps the reach of Indian hotels? I think some of these ideas were never, you know, like imagined that this is what will happen. They have evolved with time. Uh, but the digitization is one aspect uh, which has helped us. The second what has helped us is uh, being a hundred plus year old company, we were sitting on a lot of assets. So the idea was how do you manage your assets that you have in an efficient manner so that they become productive. So we were not only able to uh, increase productivity uh, based on our corporate overhead which was uh, reduced by almost 30 uh, percent adjusted for inflation, but that corporate overhead is today serving a much larger portfolio of hotels and brands. So the, so, so the efficiency went up. Uh, and I think uh, also leveraging partnerships, leveraging other Tata Group companies. We did not get steel for free <laughs> to build the hotels, but, but definitely I think... They don't get rooms for free when they have to <laughs> Absolutely. <travel. laughs> well said. <laughs> Mr. Chatwal, um, 
when the hotel industry started making a comeback i'm going to take the thank you very much when the hotel industry started making a comeback in 2021 the term media used thank you the term media used freely was it is a sugar rush this is more like a revenge travel this is something people were locked up and they're coming out and this is not going to last but the trends and and you know it's very easy to understand hotel industry you need to go to a website and pretty much know that what the prevailing market trends are unlike steel where you really have to get your hands dirty in hotel about hotel you can do dipsticks very fast the dipsticks are indicating that prices have not come down so my question to you is that what was called as a revenge travel a sugar rush has now become a trend is it true if i craft my question this way so a lot new a lot of new segments have evolved which were not existent in a pre covid uh, era and uh, i think the first time for anybody who had never driven on holidays themselves was a difficult decision second time it was a less difficult decision now all those who have done it it's a given okay let's get into the car and take an extra day off or work with a good wifi connection digitally for one day you put all your meetings and have an extended weekend is a no brainer and uh, uh, this was not uh happening before so everyone thought leisure tourism is leading but the leisure has truly become the pleasure you know the business coupled with leisure so so i think a lot of that is happening but also a lot of nice new destinations we witnessed ourselves you know rishikesh then we opened another one near Which rishikesh uh, then we opened haridwar i mean a, a pilibit house in haridwar is uh, doing rates which despite my 40 years of experience in hotel <laughs> business i never thought it would create that kind of demand so darjeeling when we opened the hotel the taj chia kutir it was off to a absolute flying start so there are a lot of new destinations which so we so have at high level demand and supply is matching demand and supply no demand is outpacing supply it is still outpacing it is still okay. outpacing and a very little happened on the supply side during covid so i think demand will continue to outpace supply and once we get the benefit of international travelers coming back and that is usually between october and march uh, whether it starts uh, takes a very good start in october or november or jan at some point it is going to come back plus large mice which is meetings incentives uh, conference congresses and events uh, which have started happening we had our a uh, very big event uh, tata connect in may in goa yeah. and after that we saw a lot of tata companies booked the same venue the same hall for their annual business conferences so i think this is uh, the the best in terms of demand is yet to come and supply will remain constrained so we and can this expect this is a multi year trend according to this you. is a multi year trend okay. uh, let me paint the big picture for you pretty much the global picture india is the fifth largest economy in the world we are one amongst the top top in terms of the market cap now for a economy of this size and for a sector like steel it is very very difficult or i would say almost impossible to just be a oasis in a otherwise troubled environment so right now it's good it's great that your india business is growing but steel after all is a cyclical commodity given how a recessionary fear is round the corner somewhere don't you think it will have a rub off effect yeah it will have an impact uh, but just like india is an island of uh, uh, economic good news relative to the rest uh, you know the steel industry will follow that sentiment right so basically what's happening you see uh, inflation in india is high but it's still comparable to what's happening in developed countries developed countries have never been used to this kind of inflation right and uh, these are not growing markets you know even if you look at uh, our footprint in europe if you have inflationary pressures on wage costs in europe uh, you have to think hard because the market is not growing whereas in india you can afford some inflationary pressures because you are, you can scale up and manage those costs so i think there are issues where india is uh, i think well placed demographically india is much better placed uh, what's happening with the covid and the ukraine war is uh, supply chains are being rethought people are looking at building resilience and not just optimizing around efficiency uh, so great time for india to be an option because unlike a vietnam or a bangladesh or many other countries who are options uh, india is not just a potential source but a potential market so people are looking at investing in india to make in india again 
uh, for India and for the world. So I think there are many things which uh, uh, make it a sweet spot for India. And like I said, we are an industry very dependent on macroeconomic factors. So we will ride that. 10% of what we produce is exported. 10% of what Tata Steel produces is exported. That part of the business will uh, reflect what's happening globally. The other thing where we think uh, things would be better going ahead is less exports from China, Japan, Korea. You know, because all of them are looking at producing steel for their domestic consumption rather than importing raw materials and exporting steel. Where do you see Tata Steel in three years? Where do you see Tata Steel in five years? I don't want to go beyond five years because ultimately it's a cyclical industry. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think uh, uh, in the last few years we've doubled our footprint in India. Yeah. Next few years we want to double our footprint in India again. So we. This is the organic route. Or, uh, Next few years will be organic, last few years was inorganic. So we grew from 10 million to 20 million in the last seven, eight years. We want to get to 40 million by 2030, but I'm assuming that the export duty will not be there for long because we've <laughs> always assumed 10, 15% will be exported. You know, So 35 to 40 million is certainly in next where five we have years. Yeah, Not next five years, by 2030, because it takes a while to build a steel plant. But because of our acquisitions, today we can grow at any pace that we want because we have the sites. We have the sites. We don't have to acquire any new sites to achieve that ambition. And you can do it without, on the current balance sheet, without Absolutely. raising too much So effort. that's the other advantage with organic growth. You can pace yourself. I think the cash flows of the India business are strong enough to allow us to grow without adding to the debt. Indian Hotel now is part of that elite club. And I call it elite club because in terms of the market cap, it is part, it is one amongst the top hotel in the world now. What are your ambitions for Indian Hotel in the next three to five years? Up the basic cyclical business, not up the structural growth. <laughs> so I think uh, uh, we will try to now aim for higher without losing sight and focus on the domestic market. We want the domestic business never to be less than 80% of the total business and uh, of the total revenue. Uh, ideally, as it should be as it is today, more like uh, 83 to 85 percent. It all depends with the fluctuations in the currencies. So, but if we can keep 80 percent domestic, 20 percent international, grow in select markets, keep our Indian ethos, the culture of Taj, what it stands for, trust, awareness, and joy. I see no reason why we should not emerge as the top five hotel companies in the world, not by scale, but because of the culture, because of the value that we uh, deliver, and because of the respect that we have earned from all the stakeholders. Goldman Sachs in its latest report talks about downgrading equities uh, in India to underweight and they believe that equities tend to suffer in the last phase of the rate hike cycle. Pankaj joins in with highlights from that note. So it's a global report.